Hello, in this lecture we will talk about the adjusting entries process. We will be able to describe the adjusting process in terms of the accrual process. We're going to describe basic rules that can be applied to the adjusting process and calculate and journalize adjusting entries related to supplies, under revenue, wages payable. Then we want to describe the effect of each transaction and the effect of omitting each transactions on total assets, total liability, owner's equity, and net income. So that we have the adjusting process. So the adjusting process to record transactions in the proper period in accordance with an accrual basis, which is governed by the revenue recognition principle and the matching principle. So what we're going to do in the adjusting process, we have looked at transactions that will take place and uh, the accounting department will enter transactions throughout a time period being a month or a year. Then what will happen is at the end of that time period, we're going to want to make financial statements. Now there are a few transactions, there are a few accounts that generally need adjustment that are not on a perfect accrual basis from the accounting department. Those are the ones that we're going to have to take a look at as of the cutoff date in order to make adjustments to them. So we have the revenue recognition principle and the matching principle. These are the accrual principles that we are applying as of the cutoff date to certain accounts. Now we are applying this cutoff date, this principles throughout the process. But there are a few accounts that need periodic adjustment, as we will see. Why do we need to adjust this process? Although performing financial activities on an accrual basis is the ideal, it is not uh, practical for the accounting department to do so for all of the accounts. So sometimes people get the idea that the accounting department somehow did it wrong and we have to fix it, we have to adjust it at the end of the time period. It's not, that's not the case. The accounting department does not enter the data wrong. We have designed the system in such a way that the accounting department does not uh, account for things on a perfect accrual basis for certain things because uh, it's impractical to do so and we're going to adjust those periodically before we make the financial statements in the adjusting process. How to think about the accrual process. So as a separate activity and or department which will adjust the financial statements at the end of the month. So it's best to think about it as a separate process in your brain so that uh, you don't get it confused with the uh, normal transactions. So you want to think about it that you're going to enter the transactions throughout the month in the accounting department and then when before you make the financial statements as of the cutoff date end of the month or end of the year you will do the adjusting process which is probably done by maybe an outside CPA firm or an adjusting department. So general rules which can help to post adjusting entries. So we'll go over these rules. Remember that every trans every uh, entry has at least two accounts affected and will have an equal amount of debits and credits. That applies to all transactions, including these transactions in the adjusting process. Adjusting entries are, are all posts as of the cutoff date, uh, which will be at the end of the month or the year. So all adjusting entries are as of the end of the month or the end of the year. Why? Because we're trying to make it correct as of that date in order to, for us to use the trial balance to then make the financial statements. So adjusting entries will generally not involve cash. So the adjusting process, unlike the transactions process where we involve cash like all the time, the adjusting process is generally not going to involve cash. Cash is something that is taken care of for the most part in uh, the uh, department, the accounting department throughout the, the, the time period, not in the adjusting process. Adjusting entries will generally involve one balance sheet account and one income statement account. So that's the rule that if you're in the adjusting process, then we're going to have one balance sheet account represented by these accounts above the blue line here. And so this being equity, so these are all the balance sheet accounts above the blue line. Here are all the income statement accounts below the blue line. So we're going to take a look at it. If we're in the adjusting process, we know that we're going to have one account up here, one account down here. And then income statement accounts generally only go up. So revenue only goes up. Remember, we can only do work and get revenue. We can't do work and get like negative revenue. We can get expenses. Expenses only go up. So wages, for example, we only pay wages, they don't pay us. So if we know those rules, we can understand which way the adjusting process will go for the most part before we even understand what we are doing. Then we can think about what we are doing. First one we're going to take a look at are the supplies accounts. First question I'm going to ask here is, what will the balance sheet account be above the blue line related to supplies? And it's not a trick question. If we look at these accounts up here, we can say, well, it's probably uh, supplies. And then if we go down to the what will be the income statement account down here related to supplies. And if we take a look at it, we can look down here and it's going to be hmm, supplies expense, we'll say. And so we know that that's going to be the case. Those are the two accounts that will be affected here. So we got supplies, we've got supplies expense. All right, so income statement accounts generally only go up. So we can see that this is an income statement account. It's an expense. These are all expenses. They only go up. 
So how do I make something go up? We do the same thing to it as what it is. Well, expenses have debit balance. How do we make it go up? We do the same thing to it, which would be another debit. So we're going to debit the uh, supplies. If we debit the supplies and the other account that is affected is this supplies, if we debit supplies expense <laughs> and the other account that affected is supplies, then we must be crediting supplies. So note that we can kind of figure that out without even knowing exactly why. So now let's talk about, you know, why that, why we would be doing that. So if we're going to take a look at the supplies, we're going to say, well, how did that supplies get there? Well, when we bought the supplies, we told the account department, whenever we buy supplies, you just post it to a credit to either cash or payable and debit supplies. Don't expense the supplies because you haven't, we don't know if we've used them yet and we need to expense the supplies as we use them. So the account department just pays for the supplies, buys the supplies, continually debits the uh, asset account. So now we need to count the supplies at the end of the time period and then uh, reduce it by the physical count. So if we count the supplies and we say that, okay, now we have supplies worth 2650 then we need to bring this number down to our physical count. And we assume that the difference is what we, of course, used. And therefore, the difference is what should be posted to the supplies expense because that is what we have now used on supply. So what we're going to do is we're going to count it. We're going to look at what's in the ledger right now. We're going to say that minus what we counted it to be means that we have to reduce uh, the supplies uh, by 2150 in order to bring it down to the physical count. That's a debit. We're going to credit it to make it go down to our physical count. And we're going to debit the expense representing the fact that we have now used those supplies. So if we take a look at that, then we have the supplies expense goes from here uh, up to here. That affects net income. Net income being this number minus these numbers. Revenue minus expenses was this. Then it's going to go down to that. On the supply side, we have supplies, the asset, which we had on hand at 4,800. Then we counted it and said that we're going to bring that down to the physical count, which in this case was 6,250. So we had to bring it down by this in order to get to the physical count. Adjust an entries related to unearned revenue. So again, if we go through our process of just asking, what, what do you think is going to be the balance sheet account up here related to unearned revenue? And once again, it's not a trick question. If you have the accounts in front of you, it's going to be unearned revenue. That's an account that's going to be affected. What's going to be the other account that's affected on the income statement related to unearned revenue? It's a little bit more tricky, but uh, if you look at this chart of accounts, it's going to be revenue in this case. And we see that revenue has a credit balance. Credit and revenue only goes up. Income statements only go up. How do we make something go up? We do the same thing to it, which in this case would be another credit. So we're going to credit the revenue account. If we credit revenue, we're going to have to debit the unearned revenue. So we can see what is going to have to happen without even knowing, you know, what we're talking about. So now let's think about what we're talking about. Unearned revenue, what is it? How do they get there? Well, some companies are going to have unearned revenue, and that's going to be something like we received cash before we did the work. A security deposit for rent of uh, is an example of unearned revenue, meaning we're giving money uh, to the the owners, not because we use the property, just but as a security deposit. So they would have to debit cash. They couldn't credit uh, income. They'd have to credit something like unearned revenue. Or if we sold magazines, subscriptions for a year, something like that, we would debit cash for the sale. And we couldn't credit income. We'd have to credit unearned revenue because on an accrual basis, we have not yet earned that revenue. Then, once we send out the magazines, we will reduce that liability by with a debit and credit the revenue account. So if we take a look at this process then, and if we determine that the unearned revenue then should be this number, it should be uh, 18000 and we have unearned revenue recorded because we had the accounting department record the unearned revenue as a debit to cash and credit to unearned revenue. Now we go back in and see how much of that we have now earned and determine that unearned revenue should now be eighteen. Then we're going to have to take the amount in there minus what we think it should be to come up with our adjustment of 8000 So then if we post that out, then we're going to say that this unearned revenue we determined needed to be uh, 18, 18. Therefore, we're going to reduce it by 8000 with a debit. That's a credit. We're going to do the opposite thing to it, which is a debit to bring it down to what we determined that it should be. And then the other side is going to be revenue. So revenue has... Our credit balance, we're going to increase it by doing the same thing to it, increasing revenue. What does that do to net income? It takes net income from here up uh, to here, so it increases net income. So therefore, notice if we omitted this journal entry, if we forgot to do it, then our, our income would be understated because this is increasing net income. If we didn't do it, then the income would be understated.
So adjusting entry for wages. So if we take a look at wages then, and we go through our same set of questions, we're going to say what's going to be the balance sheet account up here related to wages. And of course, uh, you can see it here is wages payable. And if we're going to say the income statement account down here related to wages, we're going to say mm, that's going to be wages expense. And note once again that expense accounts all have debit balances. They only go up. How do we make something go up? We do the same thing to it, which in this case would be another debit. So we have to debit wages expense. If we debit the expense here, and this is the other account that is affected, we must be crediting the payable. So we can know what we're going to do, which way it's going to go, going through those series of questions without actually really knowing why we are doing it. Now we can talk about why we would do that. Well, uh, notice if we're talking about wages that if we think about a simplistic wage pay process, we pay people every Friday, let's say. Uh, but we need things to be right as of the cutoff date, which is 1231. It's unlikely that 1231 that day lands on a Friday. Therefore, if it lands on any other day, let's say it lands on a Wednesday, then as of that date, there's been three days that people have worked in which we have not yet paid them. And uh, it doesn't make sense for the accounting department, once again, to be on a perfect accrual basis because then, you know, every second of the day, we'd have to recognize the fact that we owe these individuals money that we're not going to pay until Friday. That doesn't make sense for us to do. It's impractical. But as of the cutoff date, as of the date we make the financial statements, we want it to be right. Therefore, we're going to make this adjustment. So we're going to increase the liability for three days that we owe that we're not going to pay till Friday if, we, if the cutoff date is on Wednesday. And we're going to recognize the expense of those three days, uh, increasing the expense. So the transaction will look like this. We're going to say we're going to say that uh, we calculated that three days worth of wages is four thousand two hundred. Therefore, we're going to say that expenses need to go up, represented by this is a debit, that's a debit, increasing the expense to here. That brings net income down. So income being revenue minus expenses and um if we omitted that, then if we forgot to do this entry, if we left it off of our financial statements, this brings net income down. Therefore, if we didn't do it, our income statement would be overstated. And then the other side of it is the wages, meaning that we went from zero up in the credit directions. The liabilities are going up in this case for those wages payable. So we are now able to describe the adjusting process in terms of the accrual process, describe basic rules that can be applied to the adjusting process, calculate and journalize adjusting entries related to supplies, earned revenue, and wages payable, and describe the effect of each transaction and the effect of omitting each transaction for total assets, liabilities, owner's equity, income.